Hello there. Today we are going to cover a series that is very near and dear to my heart. The Professor Layton series. It mainly follows the puzzle loving British gentleman Herschel Layton and his young apprentice Luke Triton as they solve several puzzling cases that at first glance seem impossible to explain. The series is rather story focused and as this video goes over many of the events in the main series and some side materials to clarify their timeline and lore, I put here a big spoiler warning for the entire series. With that out of the way, let's take a look at the series itself. It consists of 7 main entries that were first released on the DS and the 3DS, some of which later also found their way to smartphones and the Switch. Previous Village, Pandora's Box, Lost Future, Spectre's Call, Miracle Mask, Asheron Legacy, and Layton's Mystery Journey, Catriel and the Millionaire's Conspiracy. It was also recently revealed that there will be a new entry in the series on the Switch, New World of Steam, which will also be the first mainline game to star Herschel Layton in 10 years. This video will cover the backstory relevant to and the events of the second trilogy in the series, consisting of Spectre's Call, Miracle Mask, and Asheron Legacy, as well as the movie Eternal Diva, which is part of the overarching story arc of these three games. They form the prequel era of Professor Layton, as the games in the movie are set before the first game in the series, Curious Village, and tell of the multi-year search for the last legacy of the ancient Azran people. The original trilogy, which starts with Curious Village, will be covered in the future, as well as the material set in the future of the series that follow Herschel Layton's two successors, Alvendi and Catriel Layton. Some backstory of these games will be covered in this video, however, given they are relevant to Herschel Layton as a character. As such, as said before, this video has spoilers for more or less the whole series. Aside from this, the crossover with Ace Attorney might be covered on its own as well. Lastly, there are numerous other side materials in the Professor Layton series, including novels, serious mangas, gag mangas, discontinued smartphone games, and discontinued pre-smartphone mobile games. These will not be covered in the future for the sake of practicality and due to their dubious canonicity. Many of these works are also lost media, the ones that are not either are non-serious in nature or are hard to cover due to their medium like the novels. And a shout out to Brilliant Pickerout, who provided some of the translations used in this video and whose Tumblr blog will be linked in the description below. That all out of the way, let us start with the first three games in the latent timeline, the movie and their backstory. The story of the Professor Layton series begins long before the dawn of modern man, about 1.2 million years ago. At this time, a race known as the Azran emerged on the planet Earth. At the dawn of their civilization, the Azran were seemingly a relatively primitive civilization that resorted to the hunting of deer and the tilling of the land with beasts of burden. However, as time went on, they discovered and developed their own language and various forms of advanced technology throughout various stages. It seems in the early days of their civilization, it allowed them to ward off the dangers of the natural world, like vultures and scorpions, or effectively, a focus on civilization. In later times, the Azran spread all around the world and built facilities and settlements in many places around it, many of which were built from a distinctive blue stone that would later be known as Azran stone. One construction of theirs was known as the Stone Circle of Planov, and housed many intricate artifacts. On a tropical island, they built a facility that harnessed the power of the moon to control the tides in an attempt to soothe nature's temper. In a windy valley, they built thousands of bird-like machines that glided on the breeze of the sky. These carried people and things, functioning as aircraft, but they never landed on the ground. In this valley was also located an underground facility with many fans that could control the wind currents in the surrounding area, with a dragon altar functioning as the facility's control panel. The Azran also made sure no weapons could be carried into this facility, as a giant magnet was present at its ceiling that would activate if weapons or violence were detected. As for Azran settlements in which people lived, a few were known. The city of Mosinia was constructed by the Azran around the legend of the Phoenix, which was said to sleep in the city. To the Azran, this figure was known as Kirun of the Everlasting Flame, a great firebird that rode on the winds of the sky. According to the legend, the phoenix possessed healing powers and swooped down on Mosinia to make it her home. 
She would sleep for years on end and cry tears of joy when she awoke, which were said to be able to cure any illness. In truth, this legend referred to a secret process in Mosinia that allowed one to find a hidden Azran library containing information on how to make an elixir that could cure many illnesses. This process involved searching for excerpts of the legend of the phoenix hidden around the town and solving puzzles with them, which in turn would reveal new parts of the legend. In the end, this led to the opening of a large sluice gate that filled the canals of the town with water, forming the shape of a phoenix. The library, located under a hill called Prisha's Hill, was located at the eyes of the phoenix figure, hence the tears in the legend. Aside from Mosinia, more settlement created by the Azran was the city of Harmony, located around the island of Ambrosia, located near what would become the United Kingdom hundreds of thousands of years later. The city had a special seal connected to it, and a legend that spoke of the Queen of Ambrosia, who loved music and fell ill. The people searched for a cure for their beloved queen, but only found an elixir for immortality after her death. The people drank it and waited for their queen to return, according to the legend. Finally, the Azran constructed an exceptionally complex mechanism known as the Infinite Fault of Akbadain in the deserts of the later United Kingdom. The Infinite Fault was named for the underground complex known as Akbadain, whose tunnels spread out for kilometers in the surrounding desert. Aquadine acted as a control mechanism, being able to sink underground or rise to the surface after a mask-shaped device was inserted in the central room of the complex. The tunnels of Aquadine were filled with many cunning traps, including puzzles, treasure that was meant to trick people into thinking Aquadine was a treasure vault, and combat automatons that fought off intruders. These took the form of mechanical mummies that followed intruders, which were divided into four types, regular ones, fast crimson furies, blue ones, and ones that moved on a grid. The mask-shaped device that controlled the runes was buried by the Azran, alongside a tablet that hinted at its true purpose. The converse side of the mask contained a map that revealed the location of Akbadine's entrance, and the Azran also constructed a wall north of the desert that contained puzzles, revealing a map leading to the location of the mask. What Aquadine and the Infinite Fault were used for by the Azran is a bit unclear, though it is known the former was not made to be lived in. It is possible the vault was used as some sort of conference room given its design. The control mechanism of Aquadine may be connected to the environmental exploits of the Azran, given its sheer size. At some point, the Azran namely also tried to rejuvenate the ecosystem of an arid desert in an isolated part of the world, but they failed as their technology was not advanced enough. At a later time, closer to the peak of their civilization, the Azran attempted a similar thing with a different desert and succeeded. They managed to create a lush jungle teeming with life out of it. Similar technology may have been used to create the Garden of Healing, located under a lake in the later United Kingdom. It was formed from water coming down from the surrounding mountains. This garden was an encapsulated part of the local ecosystem filled with pure air that could cure illnesses, hence the garden's name. It was inhabited by large manatee-like creatures, and the ecosystem inside could persist for millions of years as crystals at its top filtered in sunlight, preserving the ecosystem in its closed world. At the peak of their civilization, the Azran created a gigantic floating sanctuary that contained much of their civilization's knowledge. The sanctuary also contained many traps, puzzles, mechanisms, and automatons that were meant to guard this knowledge. The final room of the sanctuary, the Chamber of Light, contained a device inextricably connected to the final creation of the Azran, robots called golems. These were sentient and had emotions, but the Azran used them to do menial labor that they saw beneath them. They had namely grown arrogant over the long years, as they thought themselves as gods that could solve any puzzle laid before them. They thus used the golems as beasts of burden that were for example meant to carry them around and harvest their crops. The golems in time began to reflect on their condition, and asked to be considered Azran people as well, to be freed of their predicament. The Azran refused, and thus the golems rebelled, laying waste to their entire civilization. However, figures of importance, known as the Seven Sages of the Azran, managed to gather the golems inside the sanctuary and freeze it solid with temperatures near absolute zero. The sanctuary was also buried in the cold silver peaks, likely to facilitate this. Realizing their civilization had reached its end, 
The seven sages decided to leave the golems as their final legacy and create tests for future civilizations that might emerge. To put this plan into motion, he created a final golem called Aurora that was meant to be their emissary and throws her along with the sanctuary. They also created five aura stones that could together form the keystone capable of unsealing and unfreezing the sanctuary. To test the morality of those seeking the knowledge of the Azran, the sages made it so the sanctuary and golems would only fully reactivate if Aurora's heart was pierced with a knife. This was done, the golems would wreak havoc on the new civilization as it had proven itself to be just as wicked as the Azran. Sages then spread the Aura Stones across the world and created legends about them and the emissary of the Azran, Aurora, as she could activate the Aura Stones and turn them into the Keystone. Stones were hidden in the jungle created by the Azran, inside the underground facility controlling the tides, in the desert the Azran couldn't terraform, inside the facility capable of controlling the winds, and inside the town of Mosinia. The sages also built a dome that could track their location under a lake near the Silver Peaks. This dome generated a magnetic field, likely to facilitate this, but could only be activated by Aurora. It also contained a legend called the Great Riders of the Sky, which told of a time when the world was one big continent ruled by the Celestial King. He had five children, the riders, one of whom was a woman called Garza, who rode a raven-feathered steed and wielded a black blade that was sharpened on the edge of time. The riders coveted the throne of their father and warred amongst themselves for it. The wars exhausted the land and so the king drew his sword, slashing four times and slicing the land into ten continents. The children were banished to earth and the gates to the sky were sealed. His keys were scattered on earth so that his children might find them. The children from that day onwards gazed up at the sky longing to fly again. This tale was mostly metaphorical, as the king represented the Azran and the banished children future civilizations, five keys being the five Aura stones. Finally, the seven sages made it so Aurora could only be awakened if three of their structures were activated, the Garden of Healing, the City of Harmony, and the Infinite Fault. The first was sealed with a giant crest that could only be opened by following the legend of the Bird of Illusion created by the Azran. Second was sealed underwater and could only rise again if three songs were played in tandem, a song of the sea, a song of the stars, and a song of the sun. The latter two were hidden in the seal of Ambrosia, while the first one was only known to the sea, perhaps via a device that could control the tides. Finally, the infinite fault would rise if Akbadine was activated with the mask-shaped device and the solving of the subsequent riddle. Given the role Aquadine plays in this elaborate scheme, it might be that the traps inside were only set after the downfall of the Azran. When their plan was completed, Seven Sages documented parts of it on a gigantic pillar that they erected somewhere in the world. After this, the Sages, the last living Azran, presumably passed away, and so the presence of the civilization slowly faded from the world as the millennia passed on. In the millennia after the Azran fell, a new civilization was created on Earth by the species known as humans. They spread across all corners of the world and developed many distinct cultures, some of which perished in their own right. Some humans settled around old Azran facilities and made their own cultures around them. Mosinia, for example, came to be inhabited by humans who revered the legend of the Phoenix. Certain family in the town came to be the keepers of the legends, the Aura Stone and the secret process of the city which would be performed to bring about the waters of the phoenix. The city also held festivals dedicated to the phoenix at certain times. The different Azran facility that humanity settled near was the one that controlled the winds in the Windy Valley, which became known as Hugland. The humans built a chapel atop the entrance to the facility and at one point tampered with it, causing it to only generate currents that went against the other currents in the area. This caused whirlwinds to be generated, and the local people start to believe these whirlwinds came about from the wrath of a mythological figure known as the Dragon Lord, likely inspired by the dragon-shaped statue near the Azran facility's control panel. To placate the Dragon Lord, the people of Hoogland started to sacrifice brides to the chapel on top of the facility in so-called weddings. After this, a woman in town would enter the facility via an underground tunnel 
and secret the brides away to different locations near the valley so they could live out their lives. The wedding dresses would be left behind in these cases. The men of Hoogland believed the brides had been turned to wind. The women of Hoogland, meanwhile, all learned the direction of the secret underground tunnel. In time, the humans began to congregate in various nation states that spanned the globe, that were led by governments. One of these was the United Kingdom, an island nation located off the coast of the continent Europe. The capital of this nation was London, located on the banks of the River Thames, which became quite a notable city in time. One town in the United Kingdom, located near London, was called Mist Hallery, and was named as such for the thick fog that often hung in the area. The town was built on the slope of a mountain, and at its highest point was located the lake that hid the entrance to the Garden of Healing. The water of this lake was spread throughout Mist Hallery via an underground network of pipes that flowed down from the town's highest point. At some point, canals were dug to replace these pipes, so Mist Hallery came to possess many waterways. The old pipes were kept in place, albeit in disuse, and the people of Mist Hallery would travel across town in boats. In time, a legend also began to arise in the town that told of a group of bandits invading it. The girl played on her flute to summon a spectre to ward off the bandits. The people would continue to summon the spectre to guard the town, but the spectre was also set to unleash its wrath upon the town if summoned for impure means, to create its own paradise. This legend may have been inspired by the manatee-like creatures that inhabited the Garden of Healing and were known to like flute music and people but this is unclear. Another city of note in this more modern era was that of Cod, which was only accessible by train and was founded at the banks of Lake Cod, which held a lot of fish. As such, there were many fishers in the town and there was a bustling fish market. The people had to rely on fish as it was hard to grow things in the surrounding area. The people also held an annual festival in which they would hang up many lights around town. Lake Cold was also the lake where the ancient Asheron Dome was submerged, and at one point it seems a human ship lost its anchor after resting on a pillar of the dome. The dome also emitted a magnetic field, which caused airship that came in local airspace to crash down. This in turn caused legends to arise about malevolent spirits living in the lake that fed on the despair of the living that they drew in. Lake Cold also became known as the Siren Lake due to this, and all of this contributed to cold being avoided by most tourists, despite the beauty of the town's landscape. As such, the boat rental shop came to be covered in dust over the years. In a tropical region of the world, where the Azran had hidden one of the Aura stones, a man called Eduardo Popogno was at the end of his rope. He wanted to live out his days as a hermit, and so saw the sea cave whose entrance was only accessible a couple of times per year, when the tide was low. Inside, he discovered the crumbling ruins of an ancient Azran facility and the Aura stone hidden inside. This was the discovery of a lifetime and the cave was emptied. The Aura stone came to be called a Poponio after its discoverer and Eduardo started a business around it. This business was widely successful and eventually led to the founding of San Grillo, which was considered a tropical paradise. Many shops appeared in town and began to make food and merchandise based on the original Poponio. The stone itself became the subject of a tradition called the Harmony Ring, wherein it was passed around between the people and visitors of the island as they believed this would spread happiness. A few rules governed this process, as people were not allowed to give the name of the person they gave the stone to or disclose the other rules. He could also only give the stone to people of the opposite gender or married status and would only talk about the harmony ring if asked about harmony. It was also considered unlucky to hold the original Poponio for a long time. Most of this history came to be recorded in a book called From Noponio to Poponio. At one point, a desert town called Torido was founded by pioneers. One family in the town found one of the Azran's Aura stones. Many decades before the events of Professor Layton and the Curious Village, a young girl named Ruby saved the life of a young wolf called Old Red and gave him a pendant with the Aura Stone affixed as a sort of heirloom. After this encounter, Old Red would remain near the town, looking down on it from a nearby ridge, leading to rumors about the Red figure. Ruby would continue to visit him from time to time, 
would eventually stop due to becoming older. As this was going on, in the wider world, people started to make advancements in the field of archaeology. Humanity slowly became aware of the existence of the Azran, whose traces had remained behind across the world. Historian Donald Rutledge was a pioneer in this field, as he wrote a book on the subject called Ancient Histories. He investigated several different archaeological sites to look for similarities between them and identified the name Azran as their common element. Aside from this, Rutledge also documented the number of Azran sites and artifacts, though he was often wrong about their purpose due to lack of knowledge. In his book, he wrote about the mask-shaped object connected to Akbadine, known as the Mask of Chaos, which he speculated bestowed great power upon whoever wore it, and its mysterious counterpart called the Mask of Order, though its existence was never verified. He also wrote about the sun symbol of the mask, similar to 80 other ancient symbols, but originated from a civilization not connected to any of those. Other scholars also wrote about the Mask of Chaos, but could not think of what its use might have been other than a carnival accessory. Aside from this, Rutledge also described the five aura stones, but called them eggs, and speculated that they were used for decorative purposes. He also described part of the legend of the Great Riders of the Sky, and investigated the stone circle of Plainoth which was a primitive holy site according to earlier theories, but the discovery of artifacts at the site disproved this. These artifacts were the basis of a comparative study by the paleontologist Doris Pompitus, who theorized the Azran were scientifically advanced and had an evolved language. He also theorized that the Earth once had an entirely different ecosystem as well. One point, about 50 years ago as well, the wall containing directions to the location of the Mask of Chaos was discovered in the forest of the village Stansbury while trees were being cleared for new buildings. This caused the town to be all over the news and people to flock to it. Many archaeologists also tried to crack the riddles of the wall, which came to be called Norwell, but all failed and so the town fell back into obscurity. The wall's connection to the Azran was also not discovered until years later. Despite this, multiple explorers had discovered the ruins of Aquadine over the years, going into the desert from the village Craggy Dale to an oasis in the desert that shared the same source as the river Craggy. They would venture inside the ruins, but all of them perished inside to the complex's traps, leaving their skeletons behind. Rutledge's book generally caused breakthroughs in the field of archaeology, but many things about the Azran were still fake after its publishing, and evidence of their existence was considered flimsy. As such, the Azran were considered somewhat of a phantom civilization by most. Despite this, a group emerged that became obsessed with learning all they could about the Azran. They called themselves Targent, and presumably formed after discovering the Azran column left behind by the Seven Sages. The column in the modern day was located in a grimy city called the Nest, and Targent erected the obsidian tower around this column to hide its presence from the world. They presumably learned what was written on the column about the Azran's final legacy and the lesson they had learned when they reached the pinnacle of civilization. The group started out as a number of researchers who wanted to study the Azran, which soon grew more extreme as it seems they wanted to have the Azran's knowledge for themselves. About 30 years before Professor Leighton in the Korea's village, the archaeologist Leon Bronev discovered evidence of the Azran's legacy. He had become interested in archaeology as a child only thing that had interested him back then, and eventually started a family. He was married to Rachel Bronev and had two sons, called Herschel and Theodore, and Leon was about to make his breakthrough. Dargent broke into his house and kidnapped both him and Rachel. He left the two boys to live alone in their house, while Leon was forced to work for Dargent. Eventually, Rachel fell ill and died, but she told Leon to chase their dream of finding the Azran legacy with her dying breath. Leon wanted to use their technology and power for the good of mankind. After Rachel passed, he became even more determined to do so. As such, he became one of Targent's own and embraced their methods. He eventually worked his way up their ranks and became their leader, ruling from atop the Obsidian Tower. This caused the further corruption of the organization and also its rapid militarization. The scope was expanded and over the years Targent gained assassins, as well as moles in various governments, armies and police forces. He would also confront any archaeologist interested in the Azran and force them to work for the organization. 
threatening the lives of their families when they would not comply. In the end, Tarjan became a dangerous paramilitary organization operating all over the world under Brona's leadership. While that was happening, Herschel became extremely angry at both Tarjan and the Azran for taking his parents away and ruining his life. He dedicated himself to the study of archaeology in order to take revenge on both of his enemies by finding the Azran legacy for himself before Tarjan could do so. One day, an adoption was arranged as well, but they could only take one of the boys. These people were Roland and Lucille Layton, who wanted to adopt Herschel. Herschel did not want to leave his younger brother all alone, however, so he gave his name to his brother Theodore and let him go with the Layton family in his stead. Original Herschel Broneff was left alone after this, continued his study of archaeology into adulthood, eventually taking the name Desmond Sycamore. Theodore Broneff, meanwhile, was called Herschel Layton and grew up happily with his new family. One of his adoptive parents, Lucille, had been an adventurer in the past and had traveled to the Scottish town of E. John Oak Road with nothing but a fishing rod and a pen knife a decade before adopting Herschel. Due to being young when he was adopted, Herschel forgot about his elder brother over the years. When Herschel was 14, the Leighton family moved into the town of Stansbury, which was located just north of the desert in a house called the Riverside Cottage. There he attended the high school of St. Vernon and became fast friends with Randall Ascot, the son of the richest man in the town. He in turn at one point introduced Herschel to Angela, a childhood friend of his. Other people of their age of note were Alphonse Dalston, the son of a rich family, and Henry Ledore, another friend of Randall. Henry and Randall were close in childhood because Randall treated Henry like a brother and had given him a robot toy to cherish after one of Randall's maids had snatched it from Henry when he wanted to play with it. They also used to be close friends with Angela and Alphonse in childhood and went on adventures, but drifted somewhat apart when they got older. Alphonse became more interested in making money and starting his own hotel chain, while Henry continued to go on adventures with Randall, until Randall's father decided to train Henry as a butler, causing him to quit school as well. Randall was quite forceful about his interests, both being puzzles and archaeology, and would often push these onto Herschel, who was more interested in reading, but secretly enjoyed going on archaeological digs with Randall. He would also often visit Randall's house with Angela, though at one point Randall got punished for this by his father and received extra schoolwork, because his father disapproved of Randall's interests in archaeology. At school, Herschel and Randall studied archaeology under Mr. Collins and also took up fencing classes, leading to both of them becoming proficient fencers. In these years, Randall secretly studied the Norwell Wall with Henry's help and eventually managed to crack some of its secrets by the time he had reached age 17, using a simple sliding technique that the experts investigating the mystery 30 years prior had overlooked. He discovered the directions and discovered a box containing the Mask of Chaos and the accompanying tablet. He also discovered the inscriptions at the back of the mask and spent three months deciphering them, revealing a map that pointed to Thornley's Gorge in the desert. Once he was done, he intended to reveal his discoveries to Herschel and Angela during one of their sessions at his house. One day, he beat Herschel in a fencing match at school and so per their agreement, Herschel would have to come to Randall's house that night. He then attended one of Collins' classes where they had to read from ancient histories, where Randall made a bit of a scene about the Mask of Chaos and what would happen if it were to be discovered. After class, Herschel and Randall briefly met up with Angela before going their separate ways. Herschel went back to his home, intending to read as he was a bookworm, but Lucille was in a tiss because strange men dressed in black suits had appeared and taken Roland with them. She asked Herschel to find him and so he went into the village, crossing into Pebble Lane and the village's markets before finding Roland at the edge of the woods. The men, archaeologists who had wanted to see Norwell and Herschel since they knew him as a baby, had already left and so the two headed back home. Herschel went up to his room to read. After dinner, Herschel headed to Randall's house and ran into Angela on the way there. After arriving, they avoided the front door and instead rang a hidden bell to get Randall's attention. He opened the window and the two of them climbed in via some ivy growing at the side of the house. Once inside, Randall revealed that he had found the Mask of Chaos and the scribbles on his wall that were from his attempts at deciphering Norwell and the Mask. He 
He wanted to explain what he had found at the wall, so the trio snuck out and made their way through the woods at Stansbury's edge. Once at the wall, he let Herschel crack one of Norwell's mysteries and explained how he had found the mask. He then told that the engravings inside the mask led to Akbadine, that he intended to go there to find what he thought was the legacy of the Azran, a large treasure. He also wanted Herschel to come, but all of this angered Angela, who had lost her brother at an archaeological expedition and didn't want Randall, whom she loved, to suffer the same fate. She thus grabbed the mask and ran off to Memory Knoll, near Randall's house. Herschel and Randall followed her and then started arguing about the expedition, until Henry intervened. He told Angela that Randall had told him that this would be his last expedition, which convinced Angela. Following this, Herschel, Randall and Henry went back to Randall's home to prepare the expedition. Once that was done, Herschel returned home and the next day, early in the morning, Henry prepared a carriage so they could be off. Angela also appeared that morning and Randall gave her an ancient Azran artifact for her to give back when he returned. Herschel and Randall then set off into the desert and went to Thornley's Gorge. They descended into the ravine and entered Akbadine. Expedition followed in which the two of them had to solve many puzzles and confront mechanical mummies in battle. One floor even consisted entirely of a large room where mummies had to be fought. They were also separated on one floor. In the end though, Randall and Herschel reached an eighth underground floor of the complex and just had to go over a lake with some stepping stones in them to go to a final door. They started making their way there, but Herschel accidentally activated a trap that caused the water to drain into a large hole. Herschel managed to escape in time to the other side of the lake, but Randall almost fell into the hole. Herschel managed to grab him with one hand, but Randall did not want to let go of the mask of chaos which he held. This caused Randall to fall in the end, seemingly to his death. Herschel went on after this, solving the final puzzle of the door just ahead per Randall's last request and found a large treasure waiting at the other side. He didn't want it however, as it was supposed to be Randall's, and only took a single coin. He then somehow made his way back to Stansbury, being greeted by a devastated Henry and Angela. He was also scolded harshly by his parents when he returned home, but received a warm hug from them as well. The next months, Randall's parents and Stansbury were devastated by the loss of Randall. Randall's parents dismissed Henry from their household and started spending their fortune on sending expedition parties into the ruins and having new passages dug, hoping to find a trace of Randall. This was impossible, however, as Randall had fallen into an underground river, River Craggy, and washed up to the banks of Craggy Dale. He was nursed back to health by the villagers, but could not tell them anything about himself was taken in by the villager Tannenbaum, lived with him, but never did his memories return. Back in Stansbury, meanwhile, Herschel barely left his room and also did not like to go to school because everything reminded him of Randall. He eventually left Stansbury for London, as he had decided to go study archaeology in Randall's stead at Crescent Heller University. Angela also barely left her house, being disillusioned, and her parents urged her to marry Alphonse, the richest man in town. Angela was so depressed that she almost decided to do it. Henry, meanwhile, went into the ruins to look for Randall. Henry eventually discovered the Azran treasure in the ruins, making him rich overnight. He used his wealth to found a small inn called the Reunion Inn in the oasis in the middle of the desert and promised large sums of money to whoever would be able to find Randall. This led to many people flocking to the inn, starting with only a handful, though their numbers soon grew to man full expedition teams. This led to multiple expansions of the Reunion Inn and the formation of a town around it called Montedor. The Ascolts had exhausted their fortune by this time. Henry offered to have them move to Montedor. Also asked Angela to join him in the town and to wait for Randall's return together, pretending they were married. Angela was not convinced at first, but agreed to do it after seeing Henry's resolve. The Reunion Inn became Henry's base of operations for finding Randall as he had the wall with his notes moved there and also kept extensive notes about the search parties. Montedor expanded greatly in this time as well, as Alphonse had moved his new hotel change there which competed with the Reunion Inn. Because Henry was not of legal age yet when this happened, he needed a grantor, a role which Mrs. Ascolt, Randall's mother, played. Officially, all of Henry's assets belonged to Randall as well to go along with this. Henry was also helped by his financial advisor Murphy, 
who was in charge of Alphonse's finances as well. In time, about a year after Randall's initial disappearance, search parties reached the end of Aquadine and built scaffolding in its final room, connected with the surface. Montedor was built around this tunnel and eventually a monument was constructed near it to record the city's history. Finally, Henry also made a replica of the Mask of Chaos that he claimed he found in the ruins, as he thought Randall would seek out the one claiming to have the mask. In time, the mask became a symbol for Montedor. After leaving Stansbury, Herschel went to live in London. There, he studied archaeology at Gresson Heller University under the tutelage of Dr. Andrew Schrader, who Mr. Collins had told Herschel about in his high school days. In this time, Herschel became friends with Clark Triton and Brenda. The former studied archaeology along with Herschel, and the two had many good years. Clark was good at geology and identifying strata, as well as a hard-working student and favorite of the faculty staff. Herschel, meanwhile, proved to be somewhat messy, as he would often leave his books strewn across the floor. This led to him breaking a kiloscope at one time. All our time, Dr. Schrader added the dig of an enormous dinosaur fossil, with Clark and Herschel helping him to dig it out. Sort of joke, Dr. Schrader built a puzzle into the skeleton, saying how many bones it contained. Another student of Schrader in this time was Paul, who excelled in the hard sciences, though Herschel never met him because he was a year above him. Herschel and Clark remained at the university after their student days, so they came to work for it. In these days, they befriended Dean Delmona would often ask them to solve his daughter's puzzles for him. Clark became a doctor like Schrader and married Brenda, with them eventually having a son named Luke. Herschel met Luke once as a baby, but the Triton family would move to Miss Hallery at some point after. Herschel was also set to become a professor by age 27, the youngest in the university's history, three years after Luke was born. In these days, Herschel became romantically involved with Claire Foley, who worked at the Institute of Polydimensional Research. When Paul learned of this, he became furious because he too loved Claire, and this event changed his hairstyle, though he had to maintain it with copious amounts of hair gel. Paul also swore revenge on Herschel and began to call himself Don Paolo, an evil scientist who was banished from academic society as time went on due to his wickedness. Claire was a lab assistant to the scientist Dimitri Allen, who also liked her, and Bill Hawkes who were researching the secrets of time and space. I created a time machine prototype at their research institute after months of work. Bill had also secretly made a deal to sell the technology behind the machine to a large corporation for a very large sum of money, but he needed to demonstrate its viability. He thus arranged a test in which Claire would be used as the test subject, even though Dimitri was against it. Dimitri also noticed the flaw in the machine's design, however, and begged Bill to postpone the experiment, but he wouldn't hear it. On the day of the test, Herschel became professor and mostly went by Professor Layton from then on. To celebrate, Claire gifted Herschel a silk hat, which she wanted him to wear because she thought he could be a true gentleman. Shortly after, Claire went to the lab and the time machine test commenced. The machine briefly worked, as Claire was shot 10 years into the future for a brief instant, after which she returned. However, due to the design flaw, a large explosion occurred that affected the lab and a neighboring block of flats. This killed 10 people, including Claire and the parents of a boy named Clive. Dimitri was running to the lab as this occurred and went inside after, discovering the remains of Claire and the machine. His life's work and the love of his life wiped out in an instant. Bill was injured in the incident as well. Meanwhile, Professor Layton came to the scene of the incident and stopped Clive from going back into the fire to save his parents, thereby saving his life. Following the incident, Dimitri was left a broken man and Bill recovered from his injuries. He completed the deal with the company and pocketed more money than most people see in a lifetime, using it to climb the political ladder, becoming Prime Minister of the United Kingdom some years later. He also used his political influence to suppress the truth about the time machine explosion, having Scotland Yard's files on its seal to everyone except those with the highest clearance. The news didn't cover the event widely either. Professor Layton tried to investigate the incident on his own and kept his notes in a leather notebook, but he was beaten up by a gang of thugs and had to be hospitalized. The contents of the notebook were removed while he was in the hospital, forcing Layton to give up on this investigation. In the years after the incident at the Institute of Polydimensional Research, 
Professor Layton gave up investigating the incident, started teaching at Crescent Heller. He would often stay up late at his office, researching deep into the night and leaving it in a mess, much to the chagrin of Crescent Heller's cleaning lady Rosa Grimes. He also started to assist Scotland Yard with helping hard cases, such as muggings, through Constable Clan Broski. One of such instances was when a boy accused the girl Emmy Altava of stealing his wallet, with Broski about to arrest her. Layton passed by and saw through the boy's ruse, as he noticed he had new shoes and a wallet in a style mostly preferred by women. He concluded that the boy's mother had asked him to run a few errands and had given him her wallet, but that he had instead spent the money on the shoes. To explain where the money went, the boy had put it in Emmy's purse and claimed he was mugged. The boy broke down crying at this point and admitted, after which Emmy went free and later brought the boy home. This incident left an impact on Emmy and she got the professor's name from Grosky. She would remain in touch with Grosky and also followed Leighton due to this incident, but also because she had ties to Targent. She had been raised by its leader, Leon Bronev, who had also taught her martial arts and who she considered an uncle. Meanwhile, Desmond Sycamore had become married at some point and fathered a daughter. He also met the butler Raymond, who he considered a dear friend, and had become a famous archaeologist who had made a name for himself on the subject of the Azran. This attracted the attention of Targent, who threatened him to join their ranks, and killed his family when he refused. This left Sycamore a broken man who saw no hope in the world, and continued to live on for one sole reason, to take revenge on his two enemies. Targent and the Azran. He wanted to fulfill this by finding the Azran legacy first, before Targent could do so. He was also aware that he had to hurry up, as Targent was on the trail as well. As such, he started to focus on finding the three Azran structures that needed to be activated as the first step of the process. Garden of Healing, City of Harmony, and the Infinite Fault. He adopted the persona of the masked villain Jean Descollet, and first focused on the former two structures presumably doing so while traveling around in the luxurious airship Bostonius. Descollet discovered the complete seal of Ambrosia on an island somewhere off the coast of the United Kingdom, whereas archaeologists like Dr. Schrader had only been able to discover part of the seal before. From the seal, the Song of the Stars was decoded. Descollet also knew he needed the Song of the Sea to let Ambrosia rise once more. This song was only known to Melina Whistler, the daughter of famous composer Oswald Whistler, who had learned it from the sea itself. She was deadly ill, however, so Descollet approached Oswald and had Melina brought to a castle he had constructed on the island of Ambrosia. There she lived out her final days, while Descollet and Oswald worked on a device that could copy the memories of a person and store them in someone else's head, thereby allowing them to persist after death and giving them a sort of eternal life. This machine doubled as a music apparatus that could play music as rich as an entire orchestra and was called the Detragon. It was used on Melina and her memories were kept within it after she eventually passed, but the machine proved unsuccessful in transferring Melina's memories into other people, thus stalling Descollet's progress. Complicating matters was that the Detragon could only hold the memories for so long until they would fade, so the machine was tried on multiple girls, but it failed each time. Escolet also commissioned the creation of a theater built over the sea, but publicly it was made thanks to the effort of Whistler with the aid of Dr. Schrader. The theater, called the Crown Tone, was themed after the legend of Ambrosia and was also secretly part of one of Descollet's plots. Around the same time as Melina's death, Descollet also started the search for the Garden of Healing. He knew it was located somewhere in Mist Hallery, but was unsure as to exactly where. To find it, he concocted a plot with the local police officer, Levin Jakes, and hired some thugs to dig up various parts of town to find the Garden of Healing. The land of Mist Hallery was owned by land baron Even Bard in this time. It was hated in town due to charging exorbitant rents and demanding it be paid on the first day of the month without exception. He lived in a manor at the top of the town, near the large lake, and had two children, Aliana and Tony. Since they were young, those children had been friends with Lucia, the last survivor of the manatee-like creatures inhabiting the Garden of Healing. Aliana was ill, however, and this was worsened by the water pollution caused by a factory east of town that produced steam cars. As a result, even closed the factory and its workers were laid off, as a result of which many of their families became poor. 
and their children started hanging around in the market west of town. The children of the workers often hung around the market to help out their parents or just to loaf about. One of the children, Crow, eventually came up with the idea to salvage the garbage found around town, clean it and sell it at an underground black market. It started out as a game for the children, which had their own role in the process. With rumors about auctions, but grew more serious over time. The children then created a story about a figure called the Black Raven, who ran the market so customers would not try to scam the children. They also set up an elaborate test involving hidden coins for those who sold the black market to give it an air of exclusivity so people would be more likely to buy stuff. Around the time Descolet started this plot, the children sold an antique flute to even Bart, which he gave to Ariana as a gift. Bart family was also good friends with the Triton family, which had lived in the town for a few years at this point. Clark and Even would discuss intellectual matters while Luke would go on to befriend Ariana during a party. However, this came to an end as Descolet's plot started to unfold. It started with even Bart's death, when he fell off a cliff and died upon landing, which was an accident and witnessed by Clark. However, Descolet had Jake's forge Even's will to make all the land go to Clark, tying him firmly down to the town. Clark also became mayor at this point over the town's influential inhabitant Greppe, much to Greppe's chagrin. Escolet then kidnapped Clark's butler, Donald Noble, imprisoning him beneath the Triton Manor cellar and impersonated him. He started to threaten Clark with the safety of his wife and son, as he needed Clark's knowledge about the local soil to find the place where the Garden of Healing would most likely be. Even staff were all let go, and some of them found work under Clark, and Ariana and Tony were left alone in the mansion, which grew decrepit over time. Tony took on the guise of the gardener Seamus, who would turn away anyone who came to the mansion. He would sometimes also go to the market to buy provisions for him and his sister, and leave a witch's mark on the doors of those who spoke ill of his sister, causing her to become known as a witch. At the same time, Descolet had the thugs kidnap the former chief engineer of the factory back to the abandoned factory and forced him to work to create machines. The factory was made operational again in order to create many digging machines with huge claws that walked on many legs, which were meant to dig up the Garden of Healing. After a while, Descolet and his cronies start to operate an amalgamation of these machines at night to dig up various parts of the town. The machine created a thick fog to hide its true form and drained water from Miss Hallery's canals to do so. Lucia sensed this disturbance in the canals and started to attack the machine leaving destruction in the village. To calm Lucia down, Ariana would play on her flute, its sound echoing through the pipes of Miss Hallery, making it appear as if the sounds came from everywhere at once. This all caused people to think the mystical specter from legend had appeared. When this started happening in town, Luke at one point noticed a correlation between the water being low and the specter attacking. He started informing the police about this via Doland, who would then evacuate the areas where the specter would appear. This way, Luke became known as an oracle, and he kept records of the specter's attacks in his notebook. At one point, however, Brenda started noticing something was off about Doland, causing Descolet to lock her in the cellar with the real Doland. Clark made up a story about Brenda being away, causing Luke to grow distant from him, as he knew he was lying, and that Brenda would never go away without telling him. He holed himself up in his room, and used his ability to talk with animals, which he had inherited from his father, who talked to the mouse Toppy to record where the water would be low when. News of all this also never reached the wider public, as Jakes used his power in town to keep the news suppressed. He had become police chief by this point and became known as Third Eye Jakes, due to his tendency to solve every case he came in contact with, when in reality the results were more often than not faked. At his command, the police also kept out any outsiders from the town so that the conspiracy would not be discovered. About half a year after Descolet started plotting, evidence that the Garden of Healing was located in Mist Hallery was first discovered and made known to the wider public. It was called the Golden Garden and believed to be a city filled with gold and silver. This likely prompted a dig team to start digging west of Mist Hallery's northernmost lake with explosives. But they did not find anything, and so the team gradually became smaller. This also prompted some tourists to come to town. 
and though they were turned away by the police, they entered it via a back road into the mountains. About half year after that, Luke decided to ask an outsider for help with the case of the Spectre. He had heard tales of Professor Layton from his father, and so typed a letter for him with a hidden puzzle, asking for help. The letter was sent to Gress and Heller, and upon reading it, Layton immediately decided to set out to Miss Hallery. It was also this day that Emmy Altava had arranged with the Dean of Gress and Heller, Delmona, to become the professor's assistant, although she had a secondary mission to keep an eye on Layton and report his findings on the Azran to Targent. Emmy missed Layton at Gress and Heller and so intercepted him with his scooter while he was riding his car, the Layton Mobile. The two then continued to Miss Hallery, with Emmy's scooter atop the Layton Mobile and Leighton somewhat reluctantly accepted Emmy's help after she introduced herself. After a while, they at last arrived in the town, started to make their way to Triton Manor, and saw the destruction caused by the Spectre, as it had destroyed the house of a boy named Brock. This house was also marked with the Witch's Mark, which implied a connection. They also met people evacuating the North Alley region of the village, as the Spectre was said to strike there by the Oracle. Not long after this, they arrived at the manor and spoke with Clark, who was surprised at Leighton's visit and explained a bit about Spectre. He also made clear he didn't write the letter, causing some confusion. Leighton and Emmy then went to see Luke, who led them into his room after solving a puzzle. Leighton concluded that Luke had written the letter on his typewriter, as Clark always wrote his letters by hand. Clark berated him for this and then went to his study, after which Luke joined Leighton and Emmy as Leighton had figured he was the Oracle. Luke knew the Spectre would appear that night and before going to its location, he investigated other locations attacked by the Spectre, but learned few new things from that. He then checked into the hotel in North Alley, where most people had evacuated, except the owner of the hotel. Since night was still a while away, they went about town a bit and visited the fish research center in Miss Hallery's woods and also ate at Paddy's place. After their dinner was finished, Night had fallen and they returned to the hotel. From their room, they could see the street and in time, Spectre indeed appeared and left destruction in its wake, also attacking the trio's room. They gave chase, but lost the Spectre, even though Leighton saw strange things on the other side of a canal. He was not sure what it was due to the thick fog made by the Spectre. All this time, they also heard the sound of a flute and tried to find its source, but to no avail. Luke had heard from his maid Beth that an antique flute was sold at the black market, which would be investigated the next day. The trio returned to the hotel and got different rooms, as their original one had been destroyed by the Spectre. The next day, they went to the market in the south of town and came across Aunt Taffy at its entrance, a cranky candy maker who only sold her candy to children. They then went into the market proper and asked around about the black markets to the local children, but became none the wiser. One boy pointed them back to Aunt Taffy, who pointed them to a child named Gus, who spread rumors about the black market. In returning to the market, the trio was confronted by the black raven, who seemingly had the ability to teleport. And we chased the raven over the roofs of the market, while Leighton saw a piece of candy within the raven's cloak at one point, but then not at another point, indicating to him there were multiple of them. After the chase was done, a note was left by the raven, and Gus gave them a coin with the raven part on it. The trio sought out other medals with ravens on the market, and after solving a puzzle with them for Nabby, he opened the way to the black market. The auction floor, Leighton asked the black raven for information about the flute, and threatened to reveal his secret if he did not cooperate. He figured out the children of the market were the multiple black ravens, as Aunt Taffy only sold her candy to the children. The leader of the black ravens, Pro, made himself known and fetched the records pertaining to the flute pointing Leighton, Emmy and Luke to even Bard. The trio thus went to Hired Hill and made a detour to Paddy's place to speak with Greve for information, but he was not forthcoming. On the way, they heard rumors about Ariana, the witch and her mark, which supposedly caused disaster to those whose houses were marked by it. After reaching Hired Hill, the three had to climb to the highest point of Mist Hallery and go through the gardens of Bard Manor, which had become overgrown in the years since Evan's death. Once they arrived at the manor, Sheemus opened and claimed to be a gardener before turning them away. Leighton immediately saw issues with this, as the garden was clearly overgrown, yet there was a gardener, and they saw someone inside the manor. Luke thought this may have been Ariana, and they feared they may be held captive in the manor, so 
So they snuck inside via the guard tower. Inside they saw photos of Ariana and Tony, as well as Ariana herself, who indeed claimed to be a cursed witch. Seamus then intervened and booted Leighton, Emmy and Luke out of the mansion, to which Leighton saw that he had made a rash decision. They went on to collect information about the Bard estate from several people in Hired Hill, and heard from Tony's friend Sean that Seamus sometimes traveled down the canals to get supplies at the market. They followed him there, but only heard of a boy spending a large amount of money, and heard commotion about another appearance of the Witch's Mark near the center of town afterwards. Leighton spotted a candy wrapper near the mark and concluded by himself that Seamus was actually Tony, so only children could buy Aunt Taffy's candy. As such, they returned to Bart Manor and Leighton revealed Tony's actions to Ariana, so he stopped with this behavior from then on. The two did not wish to discuss the flute, however, and had closed off their hearts to the town, as the town resented their late father. Luke had similar thoughts and believed it to be the work of the Spectre, who was tearing the social fabric of the town apart that his father was possessed by the spectre, explaining his standoffish behavior. After this, they went to investigate the police station because Leighton wanted to know more about Evan's death, but was rebuffed because they needed permission from Chief Jakes, who was not present. For the time being, the group decided to split up. Emmy went back to London at Leighton's request to get records from Scotland Yard. As copies from the police reports were sent there every year. He also asked her to retrieve some notes from his office. Emmy just hopped on her scooter and visited Grass and Heller and retrieved the notes with Rosa's help. She then went to Scotland Yard, but Grosky was not there so she could not enter the archives. She needed his presence for access. Receptionist Monica told Emmy that he had been off in the city fighting some criminal, so Emmy chased him to the British Museum and back to Scotland Yard, missing him each time. Back at the yard, Emmy helped Grosky to apprehend the violent criminal, and then they went into the archives. Down there, they were helped by Inspector Chelmy and Barton, the latter of whom developed Emmy's photographs as well. She then headed back to Miss Hollery, with Grosky sprinting with her because he wanted to investigate the case. Leighton and Luke, meanwhile, start to ask around about Evan's reputation and heard things about Chief Jakes' reputation as well. It was also during this time Luke showed Leighton his notebook of spectre attacks that they visited the dig site for the Garden of Healing, of which there was no trace. After that was done, they went to the library to meet up with Emmy and found out Clark was the sole eyewitness to Evan's death from the files. After reading the files, they went to speak with Chief Jakes, who was very blunt. He did not like Leighton snooping around the town and gave him a day to leave. This prompted Leighton, Luke and Emmy to go speak with Clark, who acted suspicious. Also asked the trio to stay for dinner and Leighton to grab some wine from the cellar after the fake donut came in, but they could not find anything out of the ordinary in the cellar. Clark had hoped the trio would find Brenda and the real donut, but the fake donut came in to divert their attention by giving them information about Evan. Leighton then decided to leave early and told fake donut to give Clark his apologies. Leaving, the group was assaulted by three thugs, who Emmy quickly dispatched. All of this did give Leighton cause for concern. It was then that Grosky approached the trio as he had spoken with Chief Jakes, but told him they were behind the Spectre. He wanted more of the story and realized Jakes was misleading him before dashing off again. Leighton also thought the Spectre would appear again that night at High Yard Arch, the southern border of High Yard Hill, based on patterns in Luke's notes. After going there, the trio noticed the water level there was low and learned from Luke that he used that to make predictions. Leighton wanted to set a trap for the Spectre after learning its next place of attack and wanted to circumvent the police evacuations to do so, in order to learn the true nature of the Spectre. First, the trio asked Grebe to help evacuate the area around High Yard Arch without the police's involvement. He was willing to do so despite his beef with the Triton family because he cared for the people of the town and did not want to put them in danger. Together with a few friends, he organized the evacuation. Leighton, Emmy and Luke also persuaded Crow and the Black Ravens to set traps across town in order to stop the Spectre and track its path. After that was done, Leighton, Emmy and Luke started to line wait and when night fell, the Spectre appeared. It fell over due to a trap and Leighton got a good look at it. Before he could reveal its true nature, however, the police came in to arrest the trio for suspicion of being behind the Spectre. 
They stayed locked up until morning, when they managed to escape with help from Poppy, and hastily made for Bard Manor. Leighton had namely realized the flute sounds had traveled through the old pipe system and concluded it had to have come from there. When they arrived, Ariana and Tony knew they knew the truth and there was no use in hiding it any longer. They thus introduced Leighton, Emmy and Luke to Lucia, but right after, Jake stepped in and captured Lucia in a net. They also apprehended Ariana, all this on suspicion of Lucia being the spectre and Ariana the witch controlling it. The trio had to act fast after this, and after speaking with some of the Black Ravens, it was determined that the spectre had gone to the abandoned factory east of town. They snuck in via a back entrance with a key from the former factory worker Sebastian, discovered it was still very much operational. He had to face many puzzles to progress through the factory, talk with the chief engineer, and faced off again with one of the thugs. In the factory's deepest parts, they discovered behind a large door the machines that were the true spectre. With this discovery, the final confrontation was at hand. Leighton headed to Highyard Hill, where Jake kept Lucia and Ariana. He thought the case was done, but Leighton stepped in to explain the truth behind the spectre. In doing so, he had Luke pilot in one of the machines from the factory, then went on to unmask the mastermind. He knew Doland was behind it, because Doland had told the police every time where the spectre would appear, based on Luke's predictions. Luke's predictions weren't always correct, however, yet the police knew every time where the spectre would strike without fail. Descolé knew the charade was up at that point, and revealed himself. Emmy at that moment also came in, revealing she had found Brenda and the real Dolent in the Triton Manor cellar. After a brief introduction, Descolet called all the robots from the factory to his side, and they formed one giant machine. Lucia was freed in the process, and Descolet started to attack her, as he intended to lay waste to all of Miss Hattery. People were evacuated by Grosky at this point, while Leighton, Luke and Emmy decided to stop Descolet. Luke and Lucia worked together to distract Descolet and his robots, while Emmy disabled the circuits in the robot's legs. Leighton worked with the Black Ravens to construct the catapult. When it was done, the catapult was fired and Descolet couldn't move due to Emmy's sabotage. The robot easily rebuilt itself, however, and started chasing Leighton and company, throwing debris at them as it went. Lucia headed to the dam up the mountain and broke the smaller one, causing the town to float over and Descolet's robot to be destroyed. He made a final declaration and then fled. The water was absorbed by the canals as well, but Lucia started to destroy the main dam of Lake Mist Henry at that point. Ariana and Tony became distraught over that as it would flood the town, but Lucia would not budge. She destroyed the dam and revealed the entrance to the Garden of Healing, whose seal was undone by Leighton by following the legend associated with the bird collusion. Inside the garden, Lucia's intentions became clear. She had wanted Ariana to get into the garden so its pure air could heal her illness. She had given her life to do so, however. She passed away due to the wounds she had sustained during the battle with Descolé and from destroying the two dams. With that, the case of the Spectre came to a close. In the wake of the Spectre case, a giant Lucia statue was built in Mist Hallery in place of the destroyed dams likely to commemorate her sacrifice for the town. This and other reconstruction efforts were facilitated by the digging machines Descolet had built. Ariana and Tony were welcomed back into the town by the townspeople, though Ariana had to stay in the Garden of Healing to recover from her illness. Luke had also decided he wanted to become Professor Layton's apprentice during this case and help him solve mysteries. Clark and Brenda agreed to let Luke live with Layton and so brought him to London. They also moved back to London in this time, as Clark got a new job at Crescent Heller to work on archaeological studies with Dean Delmona. Meanwhile, Jakes was arrested and brought to Scotland Yard by Golski. Escolet managed to evade capture and fled the town with Raymond, focusing his attention instead on activating the City of Harmony. The time that the Detrigan could hold Melina's memories was running out. So Descolet sent out tickets to some of London's elites for a show held at the Crown Patone. The opera was about the legend of Ambrosia, but afterwards there would be a game for eternal life. As part of this, Descolet also hired a bunch of henchmen to carry out his orders and put mind control apparatus on several sharks and wolves to ensure the game went as planned. He himself and Oswald Whistler also worked to stay in the opera house during the game. Unbeknownst to Descolet and Oswald Whistler, however, 
One girl had been able to fully integrate Melina's memories and personality within herself. This was Janice Quatlane, the star of the opera and a good friend of Melina, who had willingly given up her body to let Melina live on. Melina enjoyed life for a while, but also realized how wrong it was what she was doing. As such, she set a plan in motion to stop her father and Descolet. At one point, under the guise of Janice, she met Nina, one of the girls that had been given Melina's memories by Oswald, specifically after she was kidnapped. Nina told Melina, in Janice's body, things that only Melina would have known. This served as the impetus for Melina writing Professor Layton a letter. Layton had taught Janice at Gresson Heller some years before, and Melina knew he could solve the mystery via Janice's stories of him. In the latter were included tickets to the opera, to which Layton, Luke and Emmy would thus went. Emmy brought them there in the Layton mobile, before going off to London to investigate things related to the case. Layton and Luke witnessed the opera, after which the game for eternal life began. A mysterious host entered the stage and explained the rules of the game. One person would win eternal life, at the cost of the life of all the other people in the room. Upon hearing this, some people ran away, but they were stopped by masked henchmen who had hidden among the actors in the play. Trapdoors in the floor opened, causing the people to fall into submarines kept in the Crown Tone's basement. Inspector Grosky then entered the theater and attempted to arrest the masked host, but it turned out to be a puppet then rose into the air like a balloon and exploded, launching the inspector into the sea as the ceiling opened. At this point, the opera house transformed into a large boat that went out to sea. Confusion ensued and Oswald claimed he had no part in it, as he was to play a part in the game. After some time, Descolet's voice sounded across the boat to explain the rules of the game. People had to solve puzzles to advance in the game and the first puzzle was announced gather at the oldest thing that could be seen before the music ran out. As the boat was filled with ancient objects, this was easier said than done, but in the end several people figured it out. They had to gather under the stars, which were far older than anything else on the boat itself. The people who did not figure this out were surrounded by Descolet's henchmen and dropped into the submarines. The second puzzle then commenced, go to see where you can see the largest crown. The boat contained many crowns. Luke figured out, based on the boat's name, that the large crown at the entrance might be the answer. This was not correct, however. Several people figured out the answer of the puzzle was the boat itself. From a distance, it namely looked like a crown. They just headed aboard the lifeboats on the crown platoon and paddled out to sea, where they could see the crown platoon's full shape. After this, engines across the lifeboats were revealed that rocketed them away into the open sea, while the crown platoon exploded. Two submarines also left the boat at this point, one with the filled contestants that went back to shore and one presumably with Descolet and the Detragon, which had been used during the opera show that was headed in the same direction as the lifeboats. While all that was going on, Emmy was out investigating in London and visited the parents of a girl who had gone missing. This was Nina, who Oswald had kidnapped as a vessel for Melina and told other people he had adopted. She also visited Andrew Schrader the next day to learn more about Ambrosia and around the same time, one of the submarines from the Crown Platoon had been approached by Scotland Yard. Emmy saw a TV broadcast about this and immediately left to get her airplane, follow the trail of the people who were still missing. While doing this, she picked up Inspector Grosky, who had been stranded at sea after trying to re-enter the Crown Platoon two times. Contestants who had not yet lost the game meanwhile, as well as Descolet and the Detragon, had made it to the island of Ambrosia. Here, the contestants had a brief respite until the game continued and rules approached them. They ran for a while as the third puzzle became clear, which was to cross a river and reach Descolet's castle. To do this, the contestants needed to deal with the wolves, and there were cages hanging nearby. Some tried to use these to cage the wolves, but it was actually more efficient for the contestants to cage themselves to keep the wolves at bay. Those who did this proceeded over the river, but Leighton, Luke and Melina in Janice's body stumbled and lost their cage. They then made their way to a shack where they built a carriage that could jump high out of various materials. This way, they made their way to the castle after the other contestants had reached it. Inside the castle, the fourth and final puzzle commenced. The goal was to go to the king's chamber out of four different rooms, 
Luke figured out the solution. The room between the letters K and G was it. Luke Melina, amateur historian Marco Brock, chess prodigy Amelia Ruth went into this room, while Leighton went into a different one followed by other contestants. Leighton nearly fell into the trap that lay in this room, but managed to escape, unlike the people who followed him. He did this deliberately because he wanted to explore the castle and eventually figured out the truth behind Oswald's supposed adopted daughter. Luke, Melina, Marco and Amelia meanwhile were imprisoned. Descolet revealed himself to them and took Amelia to the Detragon, while the others were taken away by his henchmen. They were rescued by Leighton and Emmy, who had made her way to the island with Koski, after which they headed to the Detragon's room. There Leighton revealed Descolet and Oswald's plot, as well as that Melina's consciousness had successfully transferred into Janice's body. Upon learning that, Descolet captured Melina and let a platform with the Detragon rise in the air. Surrounding the others with bulls, forced Melina to sing the Song of the Sea while he played the Song of the Stars on the Detragon to activate the City of Harmony. Nothing happened. After he failed with the second attempt, he started a special sequence that transformed his entire castle into a giant robot called the Detra Gigant. The people still inside the castle escaped after Emmy destroyed the mind control devices on the bulls. Leighton and Luke then boarded the carriage made earlier and used it to board the Detra Gigant after much trouble. Luke focused on rescuing Melina, while Leighton confronted Descolet in a sword fight, which he was on the losing end of. Leighton however explained to Descolet why he had been unable to activate the City of Harmony. He had missed the second song hidden in the Ambrosian Seal, the Song of the Sun, which was the Song of the Stars upside down. He then played both songs in tandem with Melina, singing the Song of the Sea, causing the City of Harmony to rise from the seabed around the island. This sent Escolet into a furious frenzy, as he had wanted to find the city first. He tried to hack at Leighton with his sword and destroy the control panels of the Detra Gigant in the process, before falling off the contraption, though he survived. His actions did cause the robot to start self-destructing. As it walked off the cliffs at the edge of the island, Leighton, Luke and Melina jumped off and were reunited with the other contestants, Emmy and Koski. Melina then decided to relinquish Janice's body and move on, to Oswald's despair. He played a final song dedicated to Melina's memory and was arrested by Koski afterwards. With this, the case came to a close. In its aftermath, all the wolves Descolade controlled had their mind control devices removed and the people were returned to the mainland by Emmy's airplane. After that, Nina was returned to her parents and Ambrosia became a well-known archaeological site. Leighton and Schrader surveyed it, and when a year had passed since the case with the Spectre, Ariana had healed and the Garden of Healing's existence was made public. Due to these events, the name of Herschel Leighton became well-known, as it was all over the newspapers. Garden of Healing and City of Harmony were also investigated and claimed by Targent in this time, now that they had been found to further their search for the Azran legacy. In the year following the cases with the Spectre and the Game of Eternal Life, Descolet set his sights on the final Azran structure he needed to activate, the Infinite Vault of Akbadine. In his search for this structure, Descolet visited Stansbury to seek out the riddle of Norwell. Found the village practically deserted, as over the years its inhabitants had almost all moved to Montedor. It was also at this time that Descolet heard about the story of Randall and formed a plan as a result. He would team up with Randall and use him to obtain the two masks he needed to activate the infinite vault of Aquadine, the Mask of Chaos and the Mask of Order not being aware they were two halves of the same whole. Randall held the Mask of Chaos and he was sure that Henry held the Mask of Order, so he would use Randall to make Henry hand over the Mask of Order. Randall had been living in Craggydale for the past 18 years with Tannenbaum, who treated Randall as his own son, but his memories had never resurfaced. Descolet discovered what had happened to Randall and sent him a letter that recounted his life in great detail also purported that one man had plotted to take everything from him, Henry Ledore. When Randall read that name, his memory started to flood back, as he decided to follow the plans detailed in the letter. He went to Montedor, leaving Tannenbaum behind, met up with Descolet in the Reunion Inn, 
which by this time had become an extremely expensive and luxurious hotel. Per Descolet's plan, Randall would don the garb of the masked gentleman and perform magical feats known as miracles to scare people into leaving the city. This would be explained as being part of the mask's purported magical powers. The only way to stop the miracles was to hand over the Mask of Order, to counteract the Mask of Chaos's powers. Randall would be the figurehead of the miracles, while Descolet made sure they happened behind the scenes, with Randall thus serving as Descolet's metaphorical mask. The planning for all of this took about a month. Three miracles were all spread apart and performed over the next month. The first one involved making it seem like people were transformed into horses, it took place during the nightly carnival parade, where masked people performed to honor the Mask of Chaos. A masked gentleman appeared when the carnival approached the bend in the road, before a bright light appeared that grew brighter when he snapped his fingers. When the light vanished, people had seemingly turned into horses. This feat had been performed by several of Descolet's henchmen that had been hidden in the crowd. When the flash went off, they had fled into nearby alleys, dropped their supposed belongings and let horses loose into the street from the dark alleys. The horses had been bought beforehand by the henchmen and had offered a lot of money for them. The horses were also clothed to look like they had been transformed. All of this gave the impression people had really been transformed into horses to the rest of the crowd, due to being blinded from the flash, not seeing what had gone on. The second miracle involved paintings that seemingly came to life. Descolet donated several paintings to Mont Sarten Gallery at the heart of Monte d'Or, which were vacuum sealed and contained in thick metal cases. Paintings also came with instructions on when they were to be displayed, at noon. The paintings were unsealed and displayed at the given time, but this was part of the trick. The paintings had been painted with the paint that disappeared when exposed to air due to a chemical reaction, but this took some time to occur. By the time it was nearly night, people dressed like the characters in the paintings appeared and started vandalizing nearby streets. The gallery had closed by this time and when night fell, the rioters had disappeared. When the gallery was checked, the paintings had become empty, giving the impression that the vandals had come from the paintings themselves. Due to investigations into the incident, the gallery remained closed for a time. The third miracle involved setting people ablaze. Thirteen citizens of Monte d'Or received two letters containing sets of instructions. One containing true instructions and one containing fake ones to be shown to the police. The true instructions threatened people to stay away from the plaza where the miracle was to take place, while the fake instructions told them to attend. Miracle was also advertised in the newspaper as Miracle en Rouge, a modern piece by the masked gentleman, causing a large crowd to form on the Sunday the miracle was to take place. An old tent was present in the center of the plaza and the masked gentleman could be heard, for at 1 pm the curtain over the tent was dropped. Inside were expertly crafted mannequins resembling the 13 citizens, complete with their clothes, stolen from the squash club they all attended. The tent was then set ablaze and afterwards the people were found at home unharmed. They handed the fake letters to the police as well, giving the impression they had survived being burned alive. All these happenings caused quite a stir in Montedor as the city's police scrambled to capture the masked gentleman. When the gentleman first appeared, the police started to question the doors because the gentleman held the mask that Henry had supposedly possessed all this time. This mask was a fake replica, but this was not known to the police, so Angela made up a story about someone breaking into Henry's study where the fake mask was kept. In truth, Angela had hidden the fake mask in the record hall of Henry's office in the Reunion Inn to keep the lie intact. Descolet later found the fake mask inside the inn and swapped it with Randall's real mask, likely so he could use the real mask later for his own purposes. When the incidents kept happening, the mayor of Montedor put together a special task force to capture the gentleman, but it was not very effective at this due to their inexperience. The henchmen used in the miracles were also not found because people came and went into Montedor on a frequent basis, as it was a tourist city, so it was almost impossible to track people. The mayor in time asked for help from Scotland Yard, which sent Inspector Grosky and Detective Inspector Bloom to assist. They clashed with Chief Inspector Sheffield, however, who found Bloom arrogant and Grosky somewhat incompetent. Bloom was also a more for Targent and his real loyalties lay with Leon Broneff, who was staying in the Reunion Inn while Bloom reported back to him from time to time. Broneff was also searching for the Infinite Vault and thus had tasked Bloom with finding the Mask of Chaos. He was also aware of Descolet's plot, 
but did not find it important enough that it would interfere with his own goals. Angela had started to suspect that Randall was the masked gentleman due to him holding the real mask of chaos. Due to this, she wrote a letter to Professor Layton a month after the gentleman's first appearance, when she asked for his help in figuring out the incidents going on in the city. She wrote to Layton because she wanted to find Randall before the police did, so that he might be able to bring Randall to his senses. The same day, Randall and Descolet planned their next miracle, a petrification incident. Descolet had several stone statues made and stole a chariot from the racetrack to transport them. He likely pretended to be one of the racetrack chariot inspectors and took it away under the pretenses of maintenance, tricking Henry in the process. The chariot was disassembled and then reassembled to transport the statues. It was loaded inside a large clown balloon used for the carnival, when the miracle would take place. Around the same time, Leighton received Angela's letter and headed to Monte Dor in the Leighton mobile with Emmy and Luke in tow, arriving just in time for the nightly carnival. Emmy went off to investigate on her own, while Leighton and Luke watched the carnival. During it, a single scream ran out and there was a stir in the crowd around the carnival. The balloons holding the large clown balloon in place, which were filled with buoyant gas, popped and the clown balloon came down. This caused the statues inside to be strewn around and the henchmen in charge of the miracle fled in the chariot, leaving behind tracks. The chariot was returned to the racetrack afterwards. Leighton and Luke missed this in the ensuing commotion. After the incident, the masked gentleman appeared on a nearby rooftop, spoke about Montedor being destroyed soon. He then fled with some wing-like devices allowing him to fly, after which Emmy appeared with a few horses. Luke, Leighton and Emmy chased the masked gentleman on horseback, but failed to catch up with him and so instead decided to head to the Lador mansion. Along the way, they helped tourists and ran into swindlers, but eventually reached the estate. Angela welcomed them, as Henry was out due to being busy, and explained some of the things that had happened after Leighton had left Stansbury. He was also uneasy due to knowing who the gentleman was, but didn't tell this to Leighton, though he sensed her unease. Due to Henry being out, the discussion was tabled and Angela told Leighton, Emmy and Luke, she had arranged for them to stay at the Camel's Hump Hotel in the west of town. They just headed there and on the way investigated the scene of the petrification incident, but found little there. They were told about a shopkeeper who knew some things, Ludmilla, but she could only tell them that she believed the miracles were just tricks. After this, the trio retired to their hotel and Leighton told them a bit about Stansbury for context as well. That night, Descolet had gotten tired of waiting for Henry to come forward with the Mask of Order, so he kidnapped Angela, locked her in a room in the Reunion Inn and impersonated her in order to get closer to Henry and urge him to hand over the mask. The next day, Leighton, Emmy and Luke went back to the Lador mansion to speak with Henry. He was not home however, likely due to the miracle from the previous night, but the fake Angela allowed them to look in his study. They found nothing of interest there. The fake Angela said she suspected Alphonse Dalston of being involved, due to him bearing a grudge against Henry and wanting to ruin the city he had built. The trio thus headed to Chateau Dalston, the western edge of town, where Alphonse told them he suspected Angela. He believed Henry had deliberately sent Randall into Aquadine to perish so he could take his place and Angela was resentful against him for that, so she had come up with the masked gentleman plot. He also told them about the special task force in the city hall, but was not of much help in general. The conversation was also cut short when Alphonse and Leighton received letters from the masked gentleman, which announced the next miracle at the plaza that night. When that was done, Leighton, Emmy and Luke decided to go to the city hall. There Leighton helped the special task force to figure out the tricks behind the first three miracles. Chief Inspector Sheffield also already had a suspect at this time, Alphonse. He namely believed that Alphonse was in love with Angela and wanted to bring Henry down. After solving the first three miracles, Leighton, Emmy and Luke headed out again and went to the gallery, which had reopened. On the way, they were informed that the police had found chariot tracks near the scene. In the gallery, its curator informed the trio that Henry had donated several paintings in black wrappings in order to make up for the ones involved with the painting miracle. There had been too many, so they had to be stored in the warehouse on the top floor. They also went to talk with Ludmilla again, who told them the Stellar Circus had hired a lot of costumes from her a month ago. The circus had been hired by Alphonse and often spread flyers in town. The circus itself was located near his chateau, so this location was investigated next. 
The costumes may have been used by the circus members to disguise themselves as tourists during the miracles. From speaking to the ringmaster, it became evident the costumes had been hired, so the circus workers could go into town dressed as tourists without making their work clothes dirty. Luke also spoke with Hannibal, the circus tiger, found out that Alphonse had been at the circus the night of the petrification miracle, the circus had been performing that night as well. When Leighton, Emmy and Luke then left the circus, night had fallen, so they headed to the plaza to witness the next miracle. Crowds had gathered to see it, as well as Alphonse and the fake Angela. The masked gentleman eventually appeared, appearing to walk through the air, stopping at the top of Mont Sarten Gallery. This was achieved with the gentleman walking over a wire spun between the gallery and the Celebration Boulevard, which was hard to see against the night sky. The gallery end, the wire was secured by the paintings Henry had donated. When he reached the gallery, the gentleman snapped his fingers, causing people to levitate into the air and vanish into the sky. These people were henchmen who used small devices to lift themselves up, and used the black wrappings from Henry's paintings to make it seem as if they had disappeared. Escolet had likely set up these connections with Henry's paintings to incriminate him in the miracles. When this was done, the masked gentleman proclaimed he could only be stopped if the mask of order was handed over, and his next miracle would be the next night, in the amusement park Tingley Town. He then vanished, after which the police surrounded the crowd and arrested Alphonse. Henry appeared as well, having ordered this, and proclaimed he would do anything to keep the city safe. Leighton, Luke and Emmy retired to the hotel after this, where Leighton once again told part of the happenings of 18 years prior. The next day, the first thing the trio did was to visit the city hall to prove Alphonse innocent. The police had gotten lax due to the arrest, as they believed the case was solved, and stopped working their shifts. He had some evidence against Alphonse, as he owned a chariot, which may have been used for the petrification incident, and he had the wealth required to pull off the miracles. Leighton, Luke and Emmy tried to help Alphonse during his interrogation, but could hardly put forward to tire Hannibal as a witness, so they let it be for the time. He investigated the race track and talked with its manager, Gustav, though he was not aware of any of his chariots leaving. Leighton did figure out the chariots could be disassembled for easy transport but did not discover much evidence and wanted to speak with Henry because he needed to sign off on the chariots being taken away. Henry had investigated the site of the levitation incident, then spoken with Gustav and then gone back to his manor that day. The trio just went back to the Lidore mansion where they spoke with Henry. Leighton laid out why he thought Henry was suspicious as explaining the tricks behind the petrification and levitation miracles and the ties to Henry. Another aspect was that Henry had ordered Alphonse's arrest, causing his businesses to take a huge hit, which was advantageous for Henry's businesses, who Leighton only found this out later. The spectacle around the miracles had also drawn more people to Montedor, thus generating more revenue for Henry. This made Henry angry and he directed Leighton, Emmy and Luke to leave. The trio just headed to Tingley Town and arrived after some diversions along the way, and attended some of the rides. They found little at first, but did talk to Inspector Grosky, who told them about a poster that said, A new spin on the miraculous. This prompted them to investigate spinning attractions in the amusement park. They found posters bearing the mask of chaos under a merry-go-round horse, under the roller coaster with the red arrow pointing to it, near a dislodged cable of the ferris wheel and in a pumpkin cup with a different floor from the other pumpkin cups. These posters together formed a map pointing to the control room of the park located in Tingley Tower at the back of the park. When they set off to it, they were joined by Henry and the fake Angela. At the tower, the masked gentleman appeared and vanished inside the tower, where it was pitch black. The group chased him and were tricked by a spinning floor inside the tower. It was set up so that they left it from the opposite side they had entered, while still believing they had come out via the same way they had come in. This led them into a replica of Tingley Town located behind the tower which was completely empty and had likely been constructed by Descolet's manipulation of the town's development. The group believed the people in the park had vanished wholesale due to the trickery, and the masked gentleman proclaimed that all of Montedor would soon be like this, after his final miracle on the next day that could be seen in the entire city. He also captured the fake Angela, using this to lead the rest of the group back to the tower and the normal Tingley town. People had reappeared from their perspective, oblivious to their disappearance, baffling Leighton. He, Emmy and Luke headed back to their hotel at that point, where Leighton told the final part of his tale with Randall. During the next day, Alphonse was released by the police because the masked gentleman had reappeared. 
Leighton, Emmy and Luke went to talk with him and while Alphonse was understandably upset, he did say something that allowed Leighton to discover the trick behind the Tingley Town miracle. He and his companions thus returned to the amusement park and discovered both the rotating floor inside Tingley Tower and the park replica beyond it. The question arose as to who would be capable of doing this, which caused suspicion on Henry again, as he was also continuing to invest more money into the city despite the incident. Leighton, Emmy and Luke paid another visit to the Lador mansion where they spoke with the fake Angela, who was being nonchalant about her pendant. Leighton found this odd, given she had received this pendant from Randall many years ago. Henry remained obstinate, but did allow Leighton to investigate his records. The study was investigated again, where the trio ran into Mrs. Ascot, who told them of some of her history with Henry. This made Leighton think that she was Henry's grantor, which he had heard about during the investigation. As such, the trio left again and made a stop at the city hall to look into who owned the Lador's properties. Visually, these were all in Randall's name, making Leighton realize that Henry was doing what he was doing to prepare the city for Randall's eventual return. They also investigated the racetrack after Sheffield told them that Bloom had made a discovery there. He had discovered the deception around the chariot inspector involved with the petrification miracle, told Leighton that he suspected that the masked gentleman was hiding in the reunion inn. The next destination was thus already decided upon. The trio headed to the reunion inn, where they were greeted by Mordaunt, personal assistant of Henry and manager of the inn. He showed them Henry's office, which Emmy and Luke subsequently investigated specifically for the time around the city's founding. Mordaunt and Leighton, meanwhile, investigated the record hall, where they found the real Mask of Chaos Descolle had stored there, and also the real Angela. Leighton at that point put together that Descolle had disguised himself as Angela, and so had Angela disguise herself as Mordaunt to trick Descolle. Lastly, Leighton also found some city plans, allowing him to make a connection between them and the mask. Figured the mask was the key to the ruins of Aquadine located beneath the city. After their investigation was done there, fake Mordaunt gave the trio a book left by the masked gentleman. The lights also went out at this point, the contents of the story pointed the group to one of the suits in the hotel. Goose chase followed, during which more books were found, each time pointing to a different place in the hotel where the next book would be found. During this time, Bloom also came to the reunion inn and conferred with Bronef about the Mask of Chaos, which he had not been able to find. Nonetheless, Leighton and companions search ended at the auditorium, where the masked gentleman appeared to capture Luke, and the lights went back on. The stories had been to show Leighton and company a show inside his mind, and now the show was over, he decided to build to the end. He spun ropes around the central hall of the inn, and hung Luke from them, challenging Leighton to not let him fall. Leighton managed to save Luke, after which Henry and the fake Angela came running in as well. Leighton then revealed the masked gentleman's identity as Randall, to Henry's astonishment. He explained his tale and then climbed the reunion inn to start the final miracle, the destruction of Montedor. Explosives had been laid around the rocky cliffs of the valley the city was situated in, causing them to collapse and sand to flow into the city. This caused quite a commotion, though Leighton had a plan. Roski and Sheffield handled the evacuation of the city, though Bloom had vanished, while Leighton's group headed to the monument where the city had first been founded. Behind it, Leighton discovered the main entrance to Aquadine and opened it after solving its puzzle. Leighton, Luke, Emmy and the fake Angela went inside while Henry, accompanied by Alphonse, went to the Gallery Plaza to apprehend Randall. Inside Aquadine, Leighton revealed the Mask of Chaos in order to be two parts of the same hole, placed them inside the two pillars inside the room they were in, and asked Angela, knowing she was actually Descolle, to aid him in solving the final puzzle before them. When this was done, Aquadine rose up from the ground, saving Montedor from certain destruction. This also allowed the group to rise to the surface again, where Leighton confronted Randall and exposed Descolle. He had not played the part of Angela well, allowing Leighton to see through the disguise. Descolle had already gained what he wanted with the activation of Aquadane, however, and so fled. Fake Mordaunt also revealed himself to be the real Angela at that point. After this, Leighton explained that Henry had not betrayed Randall, but eagerly prepared everything for his return. Sheffield also wheeled in Miss Ascot to prove this point, where he had ordered some policemen to get her during the sandstorms. All of this made it so Randall felt great despair, as he had betrayed everyone. As such, when an aftershock caused the rift to form in the plaza and him to almost fall in, he wanted to just fall in. 
Nathan tried to pull him out and almost failed, were it not for Henry helping. Henry then explained why he had done all of this. Randall had always treated him like a brother and given him something to cherish. With that, Randall at last accepted his place that he had returned home. Tannenbaum, who had come to Montedor to find Randall some time before, was also taken in and given a haircut along with Randall. Leighton, Emmy and Luke stayed in Montedor for a while and had good times with Leighton's old friend. Some time after this, Leighton, Luke and Emmy left Montedor again and returned to London. After fleeing the core of Aquadine, Descolet and Raymond headed to the desert outside Montedor to seek out the Infinite Fault. They managed to locate it and Descolet briefly reflects on the Azran, who had taken everything from him. However, he was cut short due to the arrival of Targent. Their military forces, led by Bronev, swarmed the area to claim it for themselves. Descolet tried to confront the soldiers, but Bronev overpowered him. He nearly unmasked Descolet. Raymond intervened at the last second with the smoke bomb, managed to retrieve his master. Bronev did not mind this much. Stargent had successfully managed to take control over the infinite vault and now controlled all three Azran structures. In the next year, Targent researched the structures, as did Descolet, presumably under the guise of his former identity of Desmond Sycamore. Targent's Mont Bloom, who had returned to London after the Monte Dor case, also became active for Targent. He robbed the British Museum of an Azran artifact, after which the robbery was investigated by Scotland Yard. Guards were given special training to prevent future robberies, and background checks were performed. The new rotations in the improved security plan were kept confidential, though the higher-ups of Scotland Yard knew of them. Bloom was among those in the know, and used this opportunity to rob more Azran artifacts, or over the course of the year. He made fake replicas of the artifacts under the guise of him recovering the stolen artifacts, and returned those to the museum. At the same time, Scotland Yard became more aware of Targent as a whole and started to investigate Azran sites across the world. While that was going on, Targent and Descolet eventually found the next location tied to the final Azran legacy, the town of Fronburg in the Silver Peaks. Two factions arrived in Fronburg around the same time, about a year after the case in Montedor. Descolet went to the town under the guise of Sycamore and found Aurora's resting place in an ice cave near the town. He decided to seal it and so the entrance to the cave was boarded up with an ice-like tempered glass, which could be opened by a control switch. The switch was hidden under a snowman and activated if both of the snowman's arms held gloss. One of the gloss was hidden on a snowman in the town. This kept the agents of Targent, who had arrived with a fleet of airships and who were prowling around town, at bay. It also gave Sycamore the time to research Aurora and the ice cave. He determined she was alive as she created a temperature gradient within the ice, and also decided to use Leighton to complete his revenge against Targent. As such, he sent Leighton a letter as Sycamore, claiming to have found a living mummy, and sent Raymond and the Bostonius to London. Leighton, Emmy and Luke responded to this invitation and boarded the Bostonius to go to Frunberg. Once they arrived, the trio went into town and heard rumors of the Targent soldiers prowling about. They also heard from one of the locals, Harold, that Sycamore had gone into the ice cave a few days ago and not come out. When they went there, they found the cave sealed and no way in sight. Leighton also noticed the snowman missing its glove. Based on this and rumors in town about the possessed wailing snowman, Leighton managed to figure out Sycamore's puzzle. The glove was retrieved and used to activate the control switch, which made quite a bit of noise and opened the way to the cave. Inside, Leighton, Emmy and Luke met with Sycamore, who explained the situation. Leighton also managed to solve a puzzle left by the Azran that caused the ice to break apart and Aurora to be released. She woke up and immediately after, Ronev and several soldiers invaded the cave and demanded she be handed over. Aurora went to their side after they threatened violence, to which she was taken to Targent Zeppelin, the head of their fleet. Aethan and companions hurried back to the Bostonius after this and gave chase to the fleet. The Bostonius could not keep up at first, so Sycamore, piloting the airship, pulled the lever. This caused the airship's balloon to be detached and it to transform into a high-speed aeroplane. In the following pursuit, Ronev sent missiles and shooter drones at the Bostonius, but Leighton managed to shoot them down with the Bostonius's guns. During this chase, the airships flew out of the region of the Silver Peaks and over several bodies of water until they were in a forested area near Cold. 
At that point, the Bostonians had managed to catch up with the Zeppelin, and Sycamore shot a grappling hook at it. Leighton and Luke used the rope attached to the grappling hook to board the Zeppelin, and then went to the cockpit after evading a Targent agent. Ronev introduced himself to Leighton, but was not willing to let Aurora go. He threatened violence, but just at that moment a shockwave from the nearby Lake Cod caused the Zeppelin systems to malfunction, and Aurora to fall unconscious. Leighton and Luke managed to take Aurora in the confusion, but she woke up when they went back on the rope. She struggled to get free, after which all three fell into the forest below. At the same time, both the Zeppelin and the Bostonius made emergency landings near the town of Cod. The professor and Luke landed in the forest relatively unscathed, but Aurora landed elsewhere and started wandering around town. Emmy and Sycamore joined the professor and Luke and started the pursuit of Aurora. At the same time, the soldiers of Targent had left the Zeppelin and the rest of their fleet, to swarm the town to find Aurora. Leighton and company asked the locals and pursued Aurora to the local train station, then to the fish market, the hut of the fisherman Boris, and the top of a cliff. During this search, Sycamore explained what Targent was to the other members of the group. They also had their run-ins with the soldiers. After reaching the cliff with no sign of Aurora, the group heard Boris screaming in fright. Thinking Targent had started to bother him, they rushed to see what was going on. They found him quivering in fear at Aurora, who had gone onto Lake Cod and was seemingly walking on its water. In reality, she was walking on ice slabs floating on the lake. Leighton noticed this and the group followed Aurora, who started chanting in the Azran language. This caused the water in the lake to part and the Azran dome under the lake to be revealed. Aurora went inside and the group followed, after which Aurora, a trance, revealed her name to them and her role as emissary of the Azran. The final legacy of the Azran lay waiting to be claimed by the successor civilization of the Azran, but only if their intentions were pure. She also told them that they needed to find the five Azran keys, and that the dome showed the way to the keys. After this, Aurora returned to her normal state, in which she had little recollection of her role as the emissary. With her help and that of the legend of the great riders of the sky, Leighton and Sycamore managed to discern the location of the five Azran keys, a world map in the dome. Their shape was also derived from the markings, as an engraving of an aura stone was present in the dome. The group decided they would go hunt for the keys, though because they were all located in a remote part of the world, preparation was required. Sycamore went ahead and back to the Bostonius to prepare a flight back to London. The rest of the group escorted Aurora back through Cod keeping her out of the hands of Targent. They had to hide her at the fish market and pointed agents Rook and Bishop to the cliff and also had to traverse fisher boats to reach the Bostonians in the end. When everyone was back, Raymond flew the airship back to London. The group stayed a few days in London to prepare for their long trip across the world. Dean Dalmona proved Leighton's long leave of absence and had Dr. Glyph to fill in for him. Emmy had also made a list of supplies the group would need. So Leighton, Emmy, Luke and Aurora headed to Kensington Street by bus, while Sycamore went to prepare things in the Bostonias. While this was happening, Detective Chief Inspector Carmichael ordered Inspector Grosky to investigate Targent, because he believed there was a mole in Scotland Yard. Due to this, Grosky began to run all across London to find leads and encounter the group. The group, once in Kensington, lost track of Aurora while talking with Brenda. Aurora was attracted to the Azran artifact still within the museum and went to it, but could not go in. There had namely been a fifth robbery, so it was under police lockdown. The museum curator had also discovered qualities about the recovered artifacts, so he had asked Clark to investigate them. With no way to enter the museum, the group returned to Kensington Street and bought a year's worth of supplies. They also bought Aurora new clothes, as they had noticed their style of clothes did not blend in well with what people in the modern day were while going to the museum. When they were done, Grosky flew by again and went into an alley to confront a group of Targent assassins. They cornered him, but luckily Emmy managed to save him from the goons. Grosky could not tell what he was investigating however, though Leighton and the others still surmised it had to do with Targent. They thus went to the Bostonians and informed Sycamore of the investigation. 
This made them concerned, so they decided to investigate for themselves and went to Scotland Yard. There, Leighton used his friendly ties with Leonard Bloom to be granted access to the Scotland Yard archives. Investigating there, they found the details of the robberies going on in the museum, which was the next destination. Clark welcomed the group inside and with Leighton's help, he definitely determined that one of the artifacts was forged. Sycamore then chipped in and together they were able to figure out that someone at Scotland Yard had been responsible. The group went back to the yard after this and talked with Grosky, after which Leighton confronted Bloom. He had figured that Bloom was the culprit and exposed him by telling him the recovered artifacts were forgeries. Bloom was not surprised by this and so he had to have known, to which Leighton concluded he was the thief. Bloom more or less admitted to it, after which he was taken away by Grosky. Following this, the stop in London was over and the group set at last out to travel the world. The group led by professors Leighton and Sycamore were not the only people traveling to various locations around the world in this time. Inspector Chelmy had gotten married with Emily Grosky, the younger sister of Clamp Grosky, and the two went on their honeymoon to various locales. Inspector never interacted with the group however, and it was only Emily who did this. Sergeant agents Bishop and Rook were also on the hunt for the Aura Stones across the world, though the main plan of Bronev was for Leighton and Sycamore's group to gather them. Roski's investigation into Targent also had not been finished yet, so he too travelled all across the world to find more leads on the secret organization. The first location that Leighton and companions visited was Fongi, a village deep in a jungle where the houses and the hair of the people were shaped like mushrooms. In the village, the Aura Stone was held by its chief Morel. Usually, he was a cheery fellow, but due to his old age, his sense of sight had become worse, and so he had started to find things less funny. His mood turned bad due to his nagging wife and back pain. He had also started to make his way around the village by his keen sense of smell, and the other villagers had noticed his sour demeanor. As such, they had started a festival on the grand stage in an attempt to make him laugh while the chief held onto his aura stone to console himself. It had been going on for days by the time Leighton and companions arrived and they tried their hand at the festival in an attempt to obtain the aura stone. Leighton and Luke donned strange masks, which the chief could not see, and Sycamore told a dry joke, which the chief did not find funny. Having failed in their task, the group began to investigate the village. Leighton eventually figured out what was going on, based on the chief not seeing a large, odorless rafflesia and always coming home at the time a smelly dinner was being served. To do something about this, the group gathered materials to make glasses. They got some bullfrog bones from Amanita, which he wanted to use for a milk cap broth, got sticky glue from a glutinous maximus snail, and transparent crystals from a waterfall cave. They then returned to the great stage and had some of the villagers help them to make glasses. Bones were cut and picked out for the frame, while certain crystals were polished to make the lenses. When they were done, the glasses were given to Chief Morel and they happened to distort his worldview. This caused him to start laughing a lot and he was willing to part with the Aura Stone, as he no longer needed it to console him. After this, the group returned to the Bostonians to continue the hunt for the stones. The second stop on the journey was Sangrio, where the group first went onto the beach and then in town. They quickly noticed however that the island was overflowing with merchandise and treats that were shaped like the Aura Stone, the Poponios. This left the group confused and after investigating, it seemed that no one really had any information about the original Poponio. It was until the group ran into Bud, the owner of Bud's Bar and Grill. He explained the basics of the Harmony Ring ritual to the group also gave them the hint that he had given the stone to a customer of his. Investigation followed in which many people were interrogated and the group had to put together the rules of the ritual. In the end, they managed to work out a chain of how the original Poponio had changed hands. Martin, who had just come to live on the island after a long journey, had given it to the sporty Javert. He had given it to the Poponio cake saleswoman Miranda. She had given it to the recently married Emily Chelmy who had tried to give it to two Targent agents who thought it was a fake. From this, they deduced that Emily had given the Poponio to Bud, who confessed when pressed. They also decided to give the original Poponio to Aurora, as he believed she was meant to have it, and wanted her to keep it. 
After this, the group returned to the Bostonians to continue the hunt for the stones. The third stop on the globetrotting adventure was Torrido, which recently had become terrorized by Old Red. Wolf had started making his way into the town instead of simply keeping his distance, because he believed he was ill and would die soon. As such, he wanted to see Ruby, now an old woman, one last time. In actuality, it was because the pendant with the aura stone around his neck had become too tight and was making him ill, though he didn't know this. The inhabitants of Torrido also did not know the wolf's true motives and so feared him, as he would aggressively walk into town many times. Leighton and companions arrived in the town during one of such occurrences and saw Old Red had the Aura Stone. Instead of following the wolf into its own territory like the Targent agents Rook and Bishop, the group decided to investigate first. They questioned Sheriff Flint, who had told them that Old Red had taken up residence in an abandoned mine north of town. Group went there and Luke communicated with Old Red, finding out his story in the process. He asked the group to bring his savior back to him, so the group went back to town to find the girl. After some investigating, they discovered Ruby's granddaughter Scarlet, who resembled her grandmother in her youth. She worked in the cowboy canteen and was willing to go along after hearing Luke had spoken to Old Red. When they took her to Old Red, Bishop and Rook were confronting the wolf, but their gun was not loaded and the wolf managed to scare them off. After this, Old Red said to Luke that Scarlet was not his savior. The group then went to Scarlet's house to wait for Ruby, who was generally knowledgeable about the town. She was angry at first because her granddaughter had gone with strangers and feared they were hunters, but Leighton figured out Ruby had been Old Red's savior. She was thus taken to the wolf and took back the pendant at the wolf's request causing his pain to go away. After this, Old Red became friendlier and was also welcomed in town, including Flint. The wolf began fanning off nasty critters and Ruby gave the Aura Stone to the group. After this, the group returned to the Bostonians to continue the hunt for the stones. The penultimate stop was in Hoogland, which was just in the process of having one of its wedding ceremonies to appease the Dragon Lord. The bride-to-be was Romilda, who was engaged to Julian. She had given up that life with her fiancé to appease the Dragon Lord and save the people of Hoogland from the ritual. When Leighton and companions arrived in Hoogland, they noticed the strong winds in the area that tore through buildings. They also heard of the wedding ceremony from the locals and especially Emmy became excited to see it so she started to take pictures. However, once they attended the ceremony and saw Romilda being sacrificed to the chapel, the mood quickly turned. Julian had tried to stop it, but to no avail and Emmy was furious and argued with the locals about the ethics of the situation. Aurora meanwhile sensed the Aura Stone was inside the chapel, but its door had been sealed as part of the ritual. The group then followed Julian to his windmill after hearing about his history with Romilda from Beatrix, one of the local women. He was despondent however and so did not care much for what the group had to say. Out of options, they decided to find a different way into the chapel and investigate the village. Few people seemed to mind Romilda being sacrificed, and the group did notice that the land around the chapel had many holes and tunnels inside it. Just as they started to work that out, Beatrix approached the group again and explained the truth behind the ritual. She was in charge of leading the sacrificed woman to other places in the valley in the current day, but unlike those other women, Romilda refused to leave, she really did want to stop the Dragon Lord. From these pieces of information, the group formulated a plan. He approached Julian again, who became reinvigorated when he learned there was a chance to save Romilda and he took a shovel. They then followed the secret instructions passed down by the women in the village to reach the tunnel leading into the chapel and Julian used his shovel to open the block tunnel. At its end was the interior of the chapel, the Asheron facilities responsible for the strong winds in the area. Romilda was inside as well, but she refused to leave until the Dragon Lord was dealt with. Leighton and Sycamore noticed the Azran make of the facility, solved the puzzle at the control panel to restore the facility to normal. This also caused the Aura Stone to appear, which Aurora claimed. With this, the winds in the area were restored and the Dragon Lord was no more. Omilda went on to live with Julian and the practice of sacrifice in the area was abolished. The group returning to the Bostonians to resume its journey. The final Aura Stone lay within the town of Mosinia, and the town was within a predicament. A week before the Bostonius' arrival in town, 
The festival of the town dedicated to the phoenix had taken place. After the children were done with the festival and went to bed, the adults returned for a gossipy after party. During this party, they ate stew made of Dormis soporis mushrooms, instead of the normal Omis nomis mushrooms. The Dormis soporis mushrooms were toxic and caused those who ate them to fall into a deep slumber. As such, after the adults of the town returned to their homes and went to sleep, they did not wake up during the next week. This left the town somewhat abandoned, as only the children remained awake. Without the adults, they were at a loss for what to do. When Leighton and companions arrived in the town, they went inside and found the town mostly empty. Soon after entering, they were met by the boy Yumit, who explained that the adults had been asleep for long, but that he didn't know why. As such, the group and Yumit started to work together to find a solution and decided to follow the legend of the phoenix. The legend spoke of the phoenix's tears, which could cure any ailment, after all. From a different child, Tamir, they heard there was a large bird on a hilltop outside of town. They thus went into the nearby woods until reaching the sluice gate, where they were met by Adler. He told Luke that he had seen the phoenix as a young bird somewhere in the town. The group thus returned to the town and spoke with Mary, the granddaughter of the current keeper of the legend, Dana. She told them that Dana spoke in her sleep, a fact the group decided to make use of. They went to the temple in town and spoke with Dana, who mumbled about the mural on the temple and a puzzle relating to the phoenix. One of the graves around the temple, which were in actuality all stone tablets, served as a clue to this puzzle, engraved on the mural. Aurora translated the language on the tablet and the mural on the temple was configured according to the passage on the tablet. This caused the plaque to be revealed near the city entrance with a different passage. Several notches had also appeared on a gate near the plaque, which represented the peaks in the passage on the plaque. Solving this puzzle caused the large golden phoenix statue in the town center to disappear and to reveal more words which pointed to the sluice gate. The group, following the trail, just went there and solved the puzzle to open the sluice gate. This caused water to flow into the canals of the town, revealing a phoenix shape. Following the tear metaphor in the legend, the group headed to Prisha's hill at the phoenix's eye. With the ritual completed, the ancient Azran library was revealed and the group used the knowledge inside to wake the adults. The two professors started working to make the recipe, with the others gathering the ingredients. This led to all the adults being awoken and they were thankful. Dana also passed on the aura stone her ancestors had held onto to Aurora as she believed that Aurora was the celestial messenger from the legends passed down in the town. After this, the group returned to the Bostonians. It should also be noted that each time after claiming an Aurora stone, part of Aurora's memory would come back and she would tell the rest of the group about the memories of the Azran. Once they were up in the skies again, Aurora tried to channel the Aurora stone's power, but failed. It turned out that one of the Aura stones the group had retrieved had been swapped with a fake by Targent at some point during their journey. Due to this, they returned to the Azran Dome in Colt to find out where the final Aura stone was, in the middle of the nest, Targent's headquarters. Bostonius was thus piloted there, though no Targent operatives were present. The group concluded from the turn of events that Targent had been expecting them and was luring them to the heart of their base. They started with an initial exploration of the nest, but they soon heard gunshots and saw Macintosh, an archaeologist they had encountered on their previous travels, being chased by soldiers. He was injured and fled into Targent's zeppelin to escape the nest, with the group giving chase to help him. They infiltrated the ship and ran into Rook, who in the end let them pass because he was getting wary of Targent. The group then found Macintosh in the cockpit and saw him fall unconscious. He was brought to the Bostonius, where Raymond nursed him back to health. The group, meanwhile, continued its way into the nest, but ran into Bishop and Rook a final time. Rook had decided he had enough of Tarjan's violent ways, both he and Bishop had decided it was time to leave. They fled with the Zeppelin, taking Macintosh with them at Leighton's request. With that done, the group pressed on inside the Obsidian Tower and discovered the large Azran pillar inside. There was a guard station in the tower, but Sycamore had prepared bombs with spores of the Dormis Soporis inside. These bombs were thrown into the guard station via a vent duct, 
causing the guards to fall asleep and allowing the group to go into a lift up the tower. At the top, Aurora read some words on the pillar, which spoke ominously of the Azran's final legacy. This did not put the group at ease, but they decided to press on nonetheless. At the tower's roof, Tarjan's second-in-command Swift allowed the group into Bronev's office. The commander of the organization made his intentions clear. He wanted Leighton to join Tarjant. Bronev also made an offer. He and Leighton would play a game for the Aura Stone with coins. Want to grab the last coin in a row of coins, where one could only grab a certain number of coins would win, which Leighton managed to do. Bronev then was about to hand over the Aura Stone, but also showed a recording of Roland and Lucille. He threatened them if Leighton refused his invitation, causing the professor to freeze. Sycamore managed to snap Leighton out of it, however, making Leighton realize the recording that Bronev showed was old. Leighton staunchly refused and was given the Aura Stone, after which Bronev left the premises. With that, the five Aura Stones were at last within the grasp of Leighton and Sycamore. The group went outside Bronev's office and used Aurora's power to make the Aura Stones change shape. Together, they formed the Azran Keystone that would be needed to access the Azran's final legacy. However, with this, Aurora's memories were also fully restored, and with it the realization of what the last legacy truly was. Aurora then tried to end it all by jumping off the Obsidian Tower with the Keystone. Leighton convinced her not to do so. Even though the nature of the legacy was terrible, events beyond their control had already been set into motion that would unlock the Azran legacy anyways. Sycamore then offered to hold onto the Keystone for Aurora, and it was at that point that he decided that his disguise was no longer necessary. He revealed himself to be Descolet to the rest of the group, to which Leighton had been none the wiser during the entire journey. He also fled into the elevator, trying to get to the Bostonians. Leighton needed to get there before him, so he constructed a paraglider out of a pterodactyl skeleton and some other materials in Bronev's office. He used this to glide off the tower and approach Descolet in front of the Bostonians. Escolay grabbed his sword and laid in a pipe from his paraglider, after which a duel commenced. Escolay would not relent, but lost the duel. Raymond then swept in in a Targent aircraft and Descolay boarded the ship, the keystone still in hand. The rest of the group, Emmy, Luke and Aurora, caught up with Leighton at this point and they boarded the Bostonius. From the Azran pillar, which said to look at the place of awakening, they deduced that they had to go back to the ice cave near Frohenborg. This is where they piloted the Bostonians to, as they wanted to stop the Azran legacy from being unleashed. Due to the Azran keystone being reassembled, the temperature in the ice cave had started to rise, and the ice that the Azran sanctuary was sealed in to melt. This process caused the mountain to start shaking, and due to fears of an avalanche, Hohenborg started an evacuation to a nearby valley. The Bostonians crash landed near the cave, and Leighton, Emmy, Luke and Aurora quickly made their way inside. There they found Descolet at the outer layer of the Azran Sanctuary, who was about to open the door inside. Leighton and Descolet started to argue, before Bronev and several Tarjan soldiers barged in. They demanded the keystone, and Descolet handed it over after threatening violence. Bronev then tried to proceed, but the Azran defense mechanism built into the room stripped the soldiers of their guns. In the ensuing confusion, Luke grabbed the keystone and gave it to Leighton, but Bronev ordered Emmy to intervene. She grabbed Luke and threatened him if Leighton did not hand over the keystone. He reluctantly did so, after which Bronev and Emmy proceeded inside the Azran sanctuary with Luke and Aurora in tow. This left Descolet and Leighton to work together in an uneasy alliance for the time, per Descolet's suggestion. The two headed deeper into the caves and soon found Luke, who had been left behind by Targent at Emmy's suggestion. She said he would only slow the party down, though in reality she still cared for him and wanted the professor to bring Bronev back to his senses. Leighton and Descolet solved the puzzle to cross the chasm that lay between them and Luke, and then entered the Azran sanctuary proper after solving another puzzle. Insides of the sanctuary also were filled to the brim with dangerous traps, which Luke and Descolet at first braved. Despite the two of them being tense, Descolet did jump in to save Luke from a still active Azran trap that shot lasers. This gravely injured Descolet, who used it as an opportunity to tell Leighton about their shared past and their connection with Bronev. He also told Leighton to stop Bronev before he could see his madness through, so Leighton and Luke proceeded, promising to come back for him later. 
boarded an elevator to the next rooms and ran into Bronev, who had just spent up his men by sending them headfirst into the Azran traps. He was just about to order Emmy to do it, but Leighton intervened and showed the path to the last room, the Chamber of Light. This chamber contained the final step before the Azran legacy would be unleashed, a sarcophagus that was to house Aurora and allowed for her heart to be pierced. Inscriptions in the room laid this out, and so Bronev ordered Aurora to go inside. He then grabbed a nearby knife that was present in the room for this purpose, and hesitated for a moment, but in the end, stabbed Aurora to see his lifelong work through. This caused the final legacy to awaken. Aurora was overtaken by the voice of the Azran people. The prism in the Chamber of Light that controlled the systems of the Sanctuary activated, and the Sanctuary itself rose into the air. Bronev briefly celebrated this, but the golems started swarming out of the sanctuary and started laying waste to Tarjan vehicles parked in the nearby valley and Frohenborg. Bronev was shocked by this and demanded Aurora explain what was going on. She then explained the downfall of the Azram and the terrible nature of their final legacy, the destruction of humanity. This caused Bronev to succumb to despair. Leighton wanted to prevent the total annihilation of humanity, so he asked if there was anything to be done, and Aurora led them back into the Chamber of Light. She explained that five people needed to block the five beams of light powering the central prism. At that point, Descolet also entered the room. He had dreamt of a conversation with Aurora, explaining to her how he had become the broken husk of a man he was. Aurora knew, however, that Descolet still had the capacity for hope and love, despite his sadness, and that he had lived through a great deal of hardship. Escolé started to reconsider things due to this and so decided to help out. Emmy and Luke also wanted to help out, but Aurora told them that they would die if they were to enter the beams. Despite this, they went through with it to save humanity. Luke, Leighton, Emmy and Escolé all went to block the beams. Aurora wanted to tackle the fifth beam, but this was impossible. As such, the group had to convince the broken Bronev to help, as the work they had done was not pointless. Humanity could learn from the Azran's failures and build a better future. Bronev realized humanity didn't have to end there, so he stepped into the final beam. This killed the five of them and deactivated the golems, causing Aurora to back the light of the Azran to revive them. She argued that humanity wasn't selfish and foolish, but cared for others and strove for a better future. It was demonstrated by the sacrifice that Leighton, Luke, Emmy, Descolet and Bronev had made. She then solved the final puzzle contained within a riddle, causing the prism to glow with a golden light, and it revived the five. Aurora tried to pass on the sanctuary to humanity afterwards, Leighton rejected this gift, as he believed humanity should build its own future. The systems of the sanctuary gave out at this moment, and it started to collapse. Aurora, being the final golem, also vanished along with the sanctuary. Luke especially took this harshly as he said goodbye to Aurora, but the group had to leave. He escaped onto some of the falling rubble, with Descolet being separated from the rest and vanishing. When the rest of the group reached the surface, Inspector Grosky was there with a contingent from Scotland Yard to arrest Bronev. He was taken away by Grosky and revealed Leighton's birth name to him. Leighton rejected him as a father. He did hope to one day be able to meet Bronev again as a friend, however. Afterwards, the police presumably returned Leighton, Luke and Emmy to London. Descolé, meanwhile, returned to the Bostonians and decided on a new life course with Raymond, as they went off to their next adventure. His whereabouts after this are unknown. Parts of Frohenborg were also destroyed, but the people soon took to rebuilding and even made a new snowman out of one of the golems. After the fall of the Azran Sanctuary, Targent in its paramilitary form presumably ceased to exist. Bronev was imprisoned and the military aspects he had introduced to their organization were gone, as the members of the military faction had died inside the sanctuary or imprisoned with him. Scotland Yard had also raided the Obsidian Tower, but had not captured all of Targent. Swift had been elected the new leader of the group after Bronev and his military men had left, with the remaining people being the ones who had joined the organization by choice. They had fled the nest and vowed to become as wise as the Azran one day. As he had led these efforts against Targent, Koski was promoted after he and Chelmy returned to London. Emmy also decided to leave Leighton's side, much to Luke's dismay. 
Her mission with Targent was over and she regretted the choices she had made. So she left Luke to be Leighton's new assistant after arranging a long holiday with Dean Delmona. She also tearfully said her goodbyes to Leighton and left to go on her own path. Leighton settled back into a life of lectures and academic papers, while Luke underwent a growth spurt and had a change of wardrobe. The two would go on to solve mysteries after this as a duo, events of which are detailed in the original trilogy of games. However, this video is already way too long, so that is a story that will be left for another time. I hope you enjoyed this look at the lore of Leighton's prequel trilogy in the movie and hope to see you next time. Goodbye!